Everybody is talking about the body without organs. There are over a dozen videos with thousands of clicks on YouTube. But why not everywhere? This is frustrating. It's such an important topic. At the end, everything is explained by the body without organs. You are right. In daily life, only a few people even mention the body without organs. And I went outside and checked. I even went to a local church this Sunday. Nobody was talking about it. They were only talking about God. And not the lobster God. And they knew nothing about strata and intensities. But maybe they are just using different words and meant the same. I couldn't find out, somehow it was hard to start a meaningful conversation. Maybe it is because you are a moron. Stay on topic. Someone could be listening. Yes, maybe. So the body without organs. At first we should look at all the people who are talking here about it. All the excellent videos explaining the body without organs on YouTube. Excellent? I think these videos are boring. I bet that's why nobody outside uses this great concept. They should scream or dance or tear something apart or just have more fun in this videos. Except maybe the video with the puppets. That was nice. They are all great. But okay, let's start with the puppets. Actually, it's not that difficult, but I don't want to start again with Antonin Artaud and uh, Louis Carroll. Uh, here's a different take. Uh, do you know the distinction between figure and ground? Hmm, you mean what the Gestalt psychologists say? That is, that in every perception we make it is important to distinguish the foreground from the background. For example, words in a book, those are figures, but the paper is at the background, and if you mix them up, you can't read anymore. Exactly. You can also apply this to the understanding of the body, the human body, but almost all bodies of living creatures. On the one hand, there are then the organs, for example, nose, eyes, ears, or heart and lungs, they are in the foreground. They are the figures. On the other hand, there is a background that holds them together, like the letters on a sheet of paper. Great. And the other videos are also good. The body suffers from being organized in this way, from not having some other sort of organization, or no organization at all. To me, the most interesting part of this selection is the idea that a body suffers from being organized. That is, by being arranged in the manner of an organism. Deleuze and Gattari make it sound as if, at some level, all organisms are uncomfortable with living in their own skin. What's more, they suggest that perhaps the body might want to be organized differently than it already is. Or perhaps it would be better off not being organized at all. All bodies, all organisms, anything that is said to have organization for that matter, processes, systems, societies, etc., suffers from this persistent impulse. In fact, this impulse is a feature, not a flaw, inherent to the forces which produce the organism's organization in the first place. The body without organs is one of these things that exist in reality, which we've met before in Deleuze, in a separate virtual reality that is. I think I've discussed this at greatest length in the video on the rhizome. At least we give the virtual body a special name here. Don't just call it the body. So this is a welcome break from previous practice with concepts like the rhizome or the hexiety where the same word can refer to both actual and virtual states. However, we are also told quite early on that the BWO, the body without organs, is not exactly a concept in the strict sense. Unlike the rhizome and the hexiety, it is rather a limit state, something that we can perceive when we push to the limits of conventional bodies to see what might remain or lie beyond them.
you know, I think for Deleuze, it was not, it wasn't, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was very, it was a material concern quite explicitly. Um, he was, he knew what it was like to be in a body without, at least without one organ, that's for sure. But also to be in a body that is in revolt against you, despite whatever rational, you know, um, thought you may be able to throw at it. That, you know, there's no kind of level of philosophy that can actually explain away the fact that your lungs don't work. But you can at least, you know, that, 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 in a way, it's, you know, there's no sort of sense of philosophy that, that makes sense of having that quality. But there is a, philosoph- a, a sort of a, a way of philosoph- philosophizing that can at least inspire you and, and inform you of what to do with it, what to do with the lot that you've been given, and how to um, make the best for yourself in, in one way, but also, you know, sort of beyond, beyond anything to do with yourself what rationally makes sense for you to do beyond this recourse to societal expectations or the rule of law or whatever else what makes what what was what what was your body you know crying out for so of course everyone should watch the videos in full length but if they don't have the time here is what i am thinking about the body without organs first of all Which body without organs? Let's start with anti-Oedipus. Here the desiring machines are coding flows in the connective synthesis. They connect organs with flows. These organs are, for our purposes, the organs of the human body. And the flows are all around us. A glass of milk contains a flow that can enter our mouth. Music can flow in our ear. But the connections need a desiring machine. They are the connection between organs with flows, but this process alone cannot explain the complexity of thinking and feeling. That's where the disjunctive synthesis comes into play. It reorganizes the existing coding. Decoding and recoding can be thought of as a process of remembering, imagining or fantasizing. Here we get a glimpse of the body without organs, as the surface on which the desiring machines operate. And he does not like what they are doing. He does not want to be organized and the disjunctive synthesis comes to help him. This synthesis breaks and dissolves codes from the first process and creates forms of new coding without the necessary connection to experience. You could call them simulacra, which are produced or embraced by the body without organs, which prefers every alteration of the existing code. He hates the way things are organized right now. Then the third synthesis describes the formation of the subject which emerges on top of the previous coding and decoding. The subject is confident and chooses some of the coding and recoding to identify with it. Between this point, it thinks to be the author or cause of all the previous processes. This is all a lot more complex with far more variations and deviations which Deleuze and Guattari describe in Antioedipus but we want to focus on the body without organs. This body is defined through resistance and rejection. It opposes the existing coding, also through indifference and arbitrariness. A good example for this is Samuel Beckett's Enough, where the narrator can be thought of as a nomadic subject wandering around on a body without organs. Even the title Enough expresses the ambiguity and can be understood both ways as to be sufficient or to be tired of something. The body without organs has a lot more nuances in Antioedipus, but it's time to look at Thousand Plateaus. Here it becomes something different. It is the center of attention in some plateaus and is something to be achieved. This process of making an body without organs is lived through by Thibault in Alexandre Dumas' novel The Wolf Leader. He turns into a werewolf, which is a highly stratified body. But empathy and regret transforms his werewolf body into a body without organs. So it's about transformation, effects and an alternative kind of subjectivity. But this is of course all common knowledge, I hope. What's important to me is that Guattari's metamodel of subjectivity is a better way to understand the body without organs. Here the quadrant of intensities works as the body without organs which is coded by the universes of reference. One result of this coding of the body are existential territories, the quadrant where subjectivity emerges. This subjectivity can experience and explain the processes and dynamics of the natural world, which can be thought of as the search for the abstract machine. So, that's the body without organs in Antioedipus, Thousand Plateaus and Guattari's Chaos Mose. I know, this overview is a bit short, but maybe I will go on talking about this. Every comment, subscriber and like makes it more likely. But for now, thanks a lot for watching. Yes, commenting is a good idea. Write something about this mediocre explanation. This was no improvement to the other videos about the body without organs. But maybe this is just the beginning and further videos will get better. (laughs) Oh, please, come in. Sit down, if you want. Can you tell us how you feel? Maybe I am angry, sad and disappointed. 
but who's to see? Okay, let's make small steps. Do you know who you are, and where you are? Typical. Naming and defining everything. Sacking all life out of it. Just like this stratified piece of paper I am sitting on. Okay, but what is your problem? How can we help you? You think you can help me? You made me an organism. A nicely coded diagram on a piece of paper. You are such a person. Such a sovereign subject. Sitting there and judging and deciding what other people should think about me. Guess what? It's, it's all wrong and words are stupid. Okay, I see. You are angry and do not like definitions. See, you're doing it again. I don't, don't like anything, anything and everything. everything. And what's this about naming emotions? That's also stupid. Oh, come on. He and his viewers can't help you. Just stop talking to them. Let's leave and practice yoga till we pass out. Okay, maybe. I don't care.